mean, there's no tablet in the sky that said it had to be simple to end up being complex. It's just a remarkable fact about the universe. So why not celebrate it? The fact that pi, pi, that, that pi, pi, right? <laughs> Let's, let's say the numbers together. 3.141592653. Well, we got a few. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's a nerd fact. That's what we got a geek Beautiful. thing going on over there. Not I thought. bad. Not bad. The fact that you take a circle of any size, a circle the size of the universe itself, and divide it by its own radius, and you get that number, that's beautiful. I have to pause, and I, I get misty thinking of this. Yeah. It's not, that's, that's just that's another one, another one, that the atoms and molecules in your body are traceable to the crucibles in the centers of stars that manufactured these elements over its lifespan, went unstable on death, exploding its enriched guts across the galaxy, scattering it into gas clouds that would ultimately collapse and make a star and have the right ingredients to make planets and people. Which means we are part of this universe. As I've said many times, and this is, goes back, the, the, not only are we in the universe, the universe is in us. That is a profound concept. And it was, I think it's the greatest gift that astrophysics gave culture in the 20th century. A beautiful picture from the Hubble Space Telescope of a distant galaxy far, far away and long, long ago. And, uh, and there's a whole galaxy, it's about a billion light years away, we're looking at it as it looked a billion years ago. So, so many of those stars no longer exist. And here's an object that's just a, a, as bright as the whole center of the galaxy. You'd think it's a star that's near in our galaxy that just got caught in the picture frame. It's not. It's a star on the edge of that galaxy that has exploded. And exploding stars shine with the brightness of 10 billion stars. They're the brightest fireworks in the universe, supernovae. And they're remarkable, and I, I keep having asides, maybe I'll get to my point eventually, but um, the, the, um, this is something that, that, that I wrote a whole book about, and someone asked me yesterday why I wrote that book, because it is the most poetic thing I know about the universe. Um, Richard wrote a great book called, our, uh, called, what's it called, Our Ancestors, what's it called? Ancestors' Tale, yes, I, I wanted to make sure I got that right. Uh, and, and I wrote a book that was a different Ancestors' Tale, it was called Adam, but the amazing thing is that every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter for evolution weren't created at the beginning of time. They're created in the nuclear furnaces of stars and the only way they can get into your body is if the stars were kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus, the stars died so that you could be here today, okay? <laughs> And, and anyway, of course, religion is outdated in the 21st century. Um, most religious people, to respond, it's, it's true that you may get many people saying they're religious, but none of them, uh, to, in the first world at least, in the developed world, to first approximation, actually believe the doctrines of their faith. They like to be religious. They want to believe, to use something from the X-Files. They, they, they want to believe in believing. So that Catholics don't really believe that when, they, that when a priest holds a wafer, it turns into the body of Christ. No one really believes that nonsense. I have, in the last week, for, for spent more time talking to Jewish atheists than, than I can count. Most of the Jews I know are atheists, and they say it's perfectly reasonable to be Jewish atheists because there's other aspects of the Jewish religion they like. So the point is that the doctrines of religion are outdated, and that's for good reason. They were created by Bronze Age or Iron Age peasants who didn't even know the Earth orbited the Sun. So, those, so the wisdom in those books is not wisdom at all. And people take the wisdom. In fact, we've actually learned something over the last 20 centuries, and, and science has taught us how the world works. Now, for science, the interesting thing as a scientist is that uh, God is completely irrelevant to science. Sci most scientists don't spend enough time thinking about God to even know if they're atheists, because they try and understand how the world works, and God never enters into it. It's just completely irrelevant. And in fact, the more we've learned about the natural world, the more we've learned that you don't need any divine intervention to explain anything. As far as morality is concerned and the person you want to be, which is really what, what I think is the heart of what, what religion... When 
religion provides many things for people, and we can't deny that. The question is, how can we take the things that people need, community, uh, support, hope, and, and use the real world to build those quantities? Because religion, if you base your beliefs and your actions on myths that are incorrect, you're ine inevitably going to take irrational actions. And so what we want to do is, is, is what science does, which is force people's beliefs to conform to the evidence of reality rather than the other way around, and not assume the answers to questions before we even ask them, and use the rational world to build a global society, not an exclusionary society, but a global world where people can live together based on the reality that we're all humans sharing this planet, and we need to work together to build a better place. A morality based on rationality and not outmoded religious beliefs. What it means is that I don't have the presumption to say there's absolutely no God. I can't prove it. Right. But what I can say is I certainly want to, wouldn't want to live in a universe with one. The universe is far okay. more exciting to me and more in, enlightening and more, and more invigorating without a God. It's the, uh, the idea that people can somehow find spiritual solace in the idea that they are being controlled by some cosmic puppet maker versus the idea that that we have this brief moment in the sun and, and our, mm -hmm. the meaning in our lives is one we create. And we, and, and we have this great ability to think about the universe. Let's, let's make the most of our brief moment in the sun. It's the central question of science, to try and understand why the universe is the way it is and make predictions about it. And to me, the fact that we've come so close to understanding the entire universe and its origins is just remarkable. I, I, I can't imagine why people wouldn't want to celebrate that and why they'd want to be afraid of that knowledge. Some people would rather that their children not know how the universe works. Mm -hmm. A for lot fear of people, that it, actually. For, yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. for fear that it will affect their faith, then no, and what a, what a, what a disservice to, to children. And in fact, in that sense, I, I would have to say, I agree with, with Richard Dawkins, that in that sense, mm -hmm. much of religion is, is child abuse. Do you get... Uh, they're, they're, they're embedded in belief systems. And what I look at is I see all the belief systems, and when you line them up, they're not really compatible with one another. So whatever they're believing, it can't be a truth that applies to everybody because other people believe what they do with no less fervor. And so I sit back and as a person who's interested in, ob in objective truths and I say, well, it doesn't look like that's a path towards an objective truth. So let people continue to think and say what they want. But as a citizen of a country that is not founded on a, on a, on a, on a religion, it's founded with, with sort of a secular construct in a way that protects whatever religion you want to express. This is protected in the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't actually mention God. Right. R rather controversial in its day. And the, the, it doesn't mention God because they don't want legislation to tell you what God to worship. They knew this. They knew how governments can persecute people who had belief systems that didn't agree with the state. They knew this. So they created those freedoms. And so we have these freedoms. Go ahead. But if you're going to create legislation that has to apply to everybody, and you're now going to put your belief system into legislation, that is not a free and open democracy. One of the signs that yeah. the second coming is that the stars will fall out of the sky and land on Earth. To even write that means you don't know what those things are. You have no concept of what the actual universe is. So everybody who tried to make proclamations about the physical universe based on Bible passages got the wrong answer. <laughs> so what happened was when science discovers things and you want to stay religious, or you want to continue to believe that the Bible is, is unerring, what you would do is, you would say, well, let me go back to the Bible and reinterpret it. Then you'd say things like, oh, they didn't really mean that literally, they meant that figuratively. So this whole sort of reinterpretation of the fig how figurative the poetic passages of the Bible are came after science showed that this is not how things unfolded. And so the educated religious people are perfectly fine with that. It's the fundamentalists who want to say that the Bible is the literally, literal truth of God that, and want to see the Bible as a science textbook who are knocking on the science doors of the schools trying to put that content in the science. Uh, 
enlightened religious people are not behaving that way. They're saying, yes, yeah, science is cool, we're good with that, and use the Bible for, to get your spiritual enlightenment and your emotional fulfillment. Uh -huh. People say, well, have you found life yet? Well, no. Well, there, you know, that's like going to the ocean, this has been said before, taking a cup of water, scooping up, and saying, there are no whales in the ocean, you know? <laughs> Here's my data, you know? <laughs> you, you need a slightly bigger sample. And so if you look at, for example, what we call the radio bubble, this is the sphere around Earth, centered on Earth, which is the farthest our radio signals have reached in the galaxy. And they're about 70 light years away. We've been transmitting radio signals inadvertently leaking into space for about 70 years. 70 light year radius sphere. Well, how big is the galaxy? We'll shrink that sphere down to maybe the size of a BB, and then the galaxy on that scale would be the size of this stage. That's how far our radio signals have traveled. And those aren't even the ones we sent on purpose. The ones we sent on purpose have traveled much less. So no, we haven't actually um, reached as far into the galaxy as we'd like before we would say definitively that there's no one intelligent living today. But here's some very simple facts. I can review them in 90 seconds. You look at the formation of the Earth and the earliest sign of fossil life. Subtract a few hundred million years at the beginning of Earth when Earth was a shooting gallery. Earth was still accreting the, the, the birth materials of the solar system. It's hostile to complex chemistry over that time. Not fair to start the clock then. Wait a couple hundred million years. Now start the clock and wait around and see when you have the first signs of single-celled life. At most, 400 million years. At most, Earth has been around for four and a half billion. So Earth, without any help from us, with basic ingredients found throughout the universe, managed to create life, simple though it was. So, an Earth, one of, you know, eight planets, get over it, uh, <laughs> what, uh, one of, sorry. <laughs> Earth, well, oh, an ordinary star, uh, to suggest, and, and what, what are the ingredients of life? The number one atom in your body is hydrogen. Number two atom is oxygen, together making mostly water that's in you. Next is carbon in this order. Next is nitrogen. Next is other stuff. My favorite element, other, yeah. <laughs> you look at the universe, the number one element in the universe is hydrogen. Next is helium, chemically inert, couldn't do anything with it anyway. Next is carbon. I think I left out oxygen there. Next is oxygen. Next is nitrogen. One for one. We're not even made of odd things. The most common things in the universe are found here on Earth, and we're made of them. I find it amazing that here we are on this random planet, in this random place in the middle of nowhere, and we have, through our minds and, and the fact that we're graced with consciousness, been able to understand the, early, the universe to the earliest moments of the Big Bang. I think it's worth celebrating. These are ideas that are fascinating. Part of the benefit of science, we always talk about technology, and of course, science is responsible for everything in this room almost. But, but for me, science is as important for its ideas and its impact on our culture. It's like great art and literature and music. It, it's, it, it's what makes being human worth being human. Mm -hmm.